Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant Cast. I'm Zach. And I'm Stephen. And we are talking today about the retail incentive. It's ground that we have tread before in various ways, but it has really cropped up recently with a number of things that uh, you know we're in- intimately involved in, flesh and blood, sorcery, and uh, the podcast discussion channel of our Discord, one of my favorite places on the planet. I uh, saw Fighting Walloon here saying, are you going to do an episode where you talk about the big discussion across several platforms about LGS support, fab, and related issues? And I guess the answer is yes. So here we are. Stay tuned. I'm going to let you kick this one off. I, I normally have something clever to say here. Not really that debatable. clever. I normally have something to say here. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's this... Uh, <laughs> Always looking for accuracy in your statements. This cloud of conversation that's going on in the tabletop gaming community, at least in the communities we're in. I'm sure in the you know Magic and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh communities, they have no idea about any of these conversations, but maybe not. I know there's... I bet a, it's always... The, I bet it's the same. It's just a lot of like... I know in the Magic, all I see in Magic is like the pitchforks and the like mm-hmm. wizards is killing my game stuff, yeah. but I'm totally unfamiliar with it. Well, I think all of this, it tends to come in, you know, it ebbs and flows and it makes sense because it's, its impact is felt more viscerally in very specific moments with specific games. And then, you know, it kind of dies away as things function normally or like decisions are made to, to smooth things out. So what we're talking about here, we're calling this the retail incentive. That's really the best, best way to frame up what these conversations are all really about. And in summary, I guess, kind of the, the initial thesis here uh, of these various arguments is that there is a distinct disadvantage for the local game store right now in selling certain retail products and that that disadvantage should be done away with uh, through uh, mechanisms that the publisher controls. Uh, Stop giving people like us or Rudy promotional cards for a game like Flesh and Blood uh, or in Eric's Curios' case, uh, doing an early pre-order for beta whenever retailers cannot also sell those products. So basically that the battleground is unfair and that it should be level if the LGS is to compete on these kinds of retail uh, opportunities. So, you know, there's a lot baked into that. And so I think we'll go immediately to the source. I'll just go and read both of the comments from which a lot of this uh, discussion stems. And then maybe we can frame the conversation out in a structured way because in in all of the, you know, you see the, the back and forth online, you know, it's online. So... It's not really an acceptable place to talk Welcome about much to of the anything. internet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like so. It's <laughs> like we, we fall for it every time, as if like something productive is going to come from all yeah. of this. Now, I will say, on our, I spent a lot of time on our Discord, and I I couldn't be happier with how much that is not the case there. So everybody on our Discord, thank you so much for that. There's actual meaningful conversations that don't just end in everybody being the same but angrier. Yeah. It's a special place. It is a special place. And if you're out there and you're not a part of it and you want to join it, you should. But if you do join it, take care because it is special. Yeah, the culture, uh, maintain the culture, please. Um, so here's here's the one that's most recent. This is uh, Flesh and Blood. And I think... And is this in our Discord or where is this coming? Th- this comes from Reddit. And it has been passed around Twitter and certain people have made comments mm-hmm. about it. There, the internet. Uh, you know, and it's making its rounds. And uh, it's about Flesh and Blood. And it simply says, flesh and blood needs LGSs more than LGSs need flesh and blood. Mm. Mm-hmm. Which is a great, it's a, I mean, it's a, that's a tantalizing title. Well, chicken and egg scenario. How could, how could one not click? Yeah, true. Right? Yeah. Okay, a bit of a rant. Because this is, there's, you're still quoting. Yeah, this is the okay. quote. This is the, it's a bit of a long quote. I couldn't about, tell. About six paragraphs. All right, I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, there have been a dozen or so comments in the last few days talking about how LGSs need to find a way to support fab, but find a way to be profitable at the same time. Mm, I already want to stop and say something, but no, I'm going on. (laughs) For the large majority of LGSs in the United States, the easiest way to increase profits and reduce costs from flesh and blood is to just drop the game. Why hold capital and employee resources on a game that brings in so little revenue when you can just buy more Pokemon and hold more Magic the Gathering events? 
can a retailer really just buy more Pokemon? I was, at if you're point? out there and you 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 have a source, hit me up. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, that's not how that works. Yeah, but you, you basically say as much as possible, please, yeah. and then you get then your you, dole. Well, they they roll a couple d20s, and then they'll tell you how many boxes you're getting. I actually wish it worked that way. It's like casting lots. That would be even better. You'd have a better shot at getting more yeah. boxes that way. Uh, there seems to be a a superiority complex among the two subreddits for Flesh and Blood, even though Fab is still an underdog. Relative to the, to the big three, Fab yeah, brings I, in... I agree with that statement. Oh, definitely. Relative to the big three, Fab brings in a tiny portion of revenue. It's still a growing indie TCG just because you have the best gameplay. It doesn't make you the top trading card game, which is very true. Man. C- completely accurate. That's two in a row. And that's completely accurate the world over in every industry. The best yeah. does not mean the top. Sometimes. Sometimes. It is, but it's not most of the time. Like that USB-A cable. Don't know what you're talking about, but I agree with you. The one where you don't know if it's upside down or not until uh, you try horrible. to plug it in. Yeah, what are we even doing? It's the one we've been using forever. It rose to the top, but clearly mm, is the worst design the cable USB there. cable. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We call it USB-A in the days was, of USB-C, I, I, my I friend. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> in, in millennial talk, it just is USB. Yeah, oh, right. I forget uh, that, yeah. But USB, you said C is the new one? Yeah, I'm ta- well, I'm, t- I'm trying to connect with the Zoomers out there yeah. listening. Hello, all of you. Uh, many of uh, one I know should be at school rather than listening to this podcast. If uh, I know that Frank is listening to this and and having those kinds of thoughts, Magic the Gathering can treat LGSs like um, poorly because Magic the Gathering pays <laughs> their employees, their rent, and their bills. Flesh and Blood cannot. Even if Legend Story gives two times the amount of support that Wizards, it is still Wizards says it is still not enough. The responsibility of promoting and advertising Flesh and Blood falls on Legend Story Studios, not on LGSs. Are you taking notes here? There's a lot to dive into in there. I'll bring it up as we go. L- no, I, can, I can just pull it up. <laughs> Don't you have a document from the past 20 years of all of these things that you can just yeah, reference? Yeah. LGSs have limited resources and will use that to promote Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Not an indie trading card game like Fab, MetaZoo, or Final Fantasy. The LGS owners in a thread yesterday saying Magic the Gathering gives more support was correct. Magic the Gathering will give special Phyrexian life counters and just announced buy a box promos for in-store purchases. I will be buying at my LGS for those sweet promos and life counters. Currently in Fab, you get rewarded for buying online with cheaper prices and even promos with certain content creators. Uh, What's being stated there is Team Covenant, Rudy, and for a time, the TCG player got some stuff and Channel Fireball got some stuff. Yeah, but right? Channel Fireball is off in space and TCG players now owned by eBay. It's kind of ironic, Channel Fireball being off in space. Well, they... they If a Fireball no, goes to Channel space, Fireball it, it got, immediately goes out. That's no? what it was. It was the roll-up. Channel Fireball got bought by TCG players. Yes. Who got bought by eBay. Right. And who knows? So maybe eBay is going to get a special promo now. Yeah, and it is also worth noting on the uh, Rudy Alpha Investments train. His is a, uh, behind a membership paywall that is only so many spots, and it's not just like yeah. you can go get into. But go ahead. Yeah, it's not. It's not exactly a direct competitor to like an an LGS. It, it's a certain kind of deal. You have to be in a very different space than a lot of LGS customers would be. Yeah, to like want to do the Rudy track. thing. <laughs> 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 I gotta get Rudy on the cast. Bryce and I were talking about getting like Rudy, Professor mm. Rodney, like, and just having a real conversation. Just like, who are you? Like, let's let's actually I, drop the persona for a second. Let's I, talk. I would be interested. I would okay. listen. You have one listener. I got off the boat already. Um, why on earth should I ever buy from an LGS when I can get n- when I get negatively penalized for supporting my local store? Online retailers are so much cheaper, especially when you buy several cases of each set. Giving promos when you buy in store would even the playing field. Given only a third of stores in the U.S. hold flesh and blood, as stated by James White. That's actually a pretty impressive IMO. If Fab is to grow, there needs to be massive incentives to LGSs to hold events and promote the game. LSS giving more support than Wizards of the Coast is the bare minimum given a 30-year head start. Now, we have an edit here. I'm not even against online retailers and content creators as they serve a critical role in the community. I even think they, they do deserve their special promos. Just give us a pitch coin, fab dice, or even full art, alt art promo for every case we buy in store. So that's the first of the flesh and blood. Saddle uh, things, up. Which I think echoes a lot of uh, a lot of actual sentiment and is not it's not wrong. I don't think it's like a strictly wrong take. I think there's a perspective, there's a bunch of different perspectives that you can attack this problem with, and this is one of them that we just heard. 
Uh, and then uh, on the beta box front, on the sorcery front, uh, here's a quick comment. Uh, that's similar. When you provide exclusive access and perks to one store, what incentive does any other store have to offer the product? Hmm. Every customer is advantaged ordering through us, Team Covenant. You can get your beta boxes until the end of March. Anybody listening, please. With an exclusive. With an exclusive Altar, lightning, bolt. lightning bolt promo. <laughs> and it's awesome, dude. It's so awesome. Uh, you should definitely foil, get on that. Mm -hmm. Some cool foil treatment stuff going on. So anyway, at that said, every customer is advantaged ordering through us uh, uh -huh. rather than their LGS due to this arrangement. Yeah. Okay. I back the Kickstarter as an LGS and will not be carrying the product beyond that until they demonstrate they know how to handle distribution equitably. So there's that's, a number of themes here. Yeah, that's a, equitability that's a jump. and incentives and what Fairness. is a retailer to do in a world where um, certain other retailers might have advantages over them. Well, there's a lot to say here. Um, well, I hope so. We've got about 40 minutes. Okay. If we can get it I in. I think we can fill fill 40 minutes yeah i don't know we might run out <laughs> i might run out of juice in the tank <laughs> so one thing i, I want to note on the the thread about fab that you shared is towards the end of the thread there was a a piece that i want to just make clear because this is something that we struggled into for a very long time um and let me see if i can scroll down and find it so uh do, 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 do. You're not as vitriolic as you need to be right now. I want more. I want more drama. More heat. Can you get? Can you get yeah. more? Like, can you get some hot takes that get people on Twitter upset? I mean, I could. <laughs> I, I definitely have some hot takes. Actually, uh, no. So, let's hold that off. <laughs> so the post set online retailers are so much cheaper, especially when you buy several cases of each set. Uh, giving promos when you buy in store, but even the playing field. So there's there's a lot of pieces, and and you know I, I don't think it's super productive to take someone's. Uh, text-based singular thread and just going through line by line and like making counterpoints when they yeah. aren't there to respond because it's not a conversation. I've been right? on Facebook, man. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's exactly, it's totally <laughs> Facebook. That's that's part of the problem, right? <laughs> um, but I will say uh, as a local retailer here in Tulsa uh, s since when we opened in 2012, uh, an off-sited example I have is with the X-Wing Wave that costs a couple hundred dollars and I get a friend buying it from us and saying, hey, just see where I could have bought this online for like a hundred plus dollars cheaper. So my point is, one, uh, there's a fundamental reality here, which is retailers, online, local, uh, mass market, yeah. um, even basement retailers, which is, you know. Yeah, well, how do you define a basement retailer? A, That's a fun term. A basement retailer to me is old Jimmy who... Uh, basically has a basement or an extra room in his house or he has a website or whatever. No, I think it has, to, it has to be a basement. Yeah. And so like it, it's technically Covenant started as a basement retailer. Oh yeah. That's so true. That's uh, I was in college and had a couple hundred dollars. I actually bought boxes at retail straight up, just whatever I could find online boxes. Um, bought the boxes, got them in, opened up my cards and sold singles on a website. Like that was that was the first thing that Covenant did. How could you make money doing that? That makes no sense. I know. It's crazy. It's a wild wild time. It's a different time. Um, but then like a natural next step, right, was how do I get boxes from distribution? And so at that point, we don't have a local retail store, but we get set up with a distribution account, which is crazy to think about actually. I'm an 18-year-old kid in college buying boxes to put in my dorm room from a distributor and they approve the account for some reason because <laughs> I set up a sole proprietorship or a whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, I'm official. I can give you a phone number and I can answer most times of the day except for when I'm in class. Yeah, that's all you need. Um, but that's what I mean by basement is like you, you're not a retailer, right? Um, you just have, you have a distribution account. Yeah. Yeah. Which is easier to get than one might expect. But mm -hmm. the reality is that uh, local retail has had to compete against deep, di what I call deep discount online retail for a very long time. And this is uh, everything from just the giant warehouse website selling it to anyone that, like back when Fab was going crazy, tons of people trying to set up distributor, Pokemon going crazy, tons of people trying to set up distributor accounts, get access to product uh, because it's like guaranteed money, right? During yeah. those particular yeah. uh, phases. But the assertion... Uh, to unpack it, and I don't know exactly where you wanted to go with all this, but I just wanted to set in that reality uh, down, which is like... This we, isn't new. It, yeah, when you have two entities selling the exact same product, 
you, as a business, you're trying to find a competitive advantage. And one of the common things that you can fight on is price. Yeah. Because if it's the same exact product, you know, nor, you know, it's different when you're sorcery competing with fab, competing with magic. Sure. You're competing on different factors other than just price. Price yeah. is a factor. Mm -hmm. Price of booster boxes, that kind of stuff. So anyways, that, that, that just stuck out to me. It's like, that's not new. That, yeah. That's just the factor of the industry. And it's also not new that local bookstores had issues with Amazon coming around or Barnes and Noble or Borders. Yeah. And you know, this is a common thing when you have the same products, what are you then competing on to your point? Price and maybe others. Like, and that's kind of, I think where we are in this conversation. So let's just, let's just break it down into these incentives because th this term is used a lot and the, the statements being brought to this conversation are, there's a couple of them that are notable to actually hold on to. One of them is that publishers should be incentivizing players to buy from local retail above other options they have. So that's like the first thing that most of the perspective is built on that. Uh, the second thing is what incentive does a retailer have to sell a publisher's product in a world where it is unequal uh, competitive factors, which is the case for all, uh, I guess, capitalist societies at least. Uh, and then finally, there's two other incentives that are often not cited. One is one incentive does a player to have to buy from a retailer and one incentive does a publisher have to sell to a retailer. Hmm. And so if you look at every side of this, right, the, the customer has to have an incentive to buy, the publisher has an, has an incentive to sell, and the retailer has to have an incentive to sell. So for that product to get to the customer, it has to kind of go through all of these things. And if a publisher doesn't have an incentive to send it to retail, the player then has an incentive to seek it out somewhere else, right? So you see these different things, and, and we these are, are well noted that there are different incentives popping up to buy a play from different things, uh, different entities. And presumably the publisher is using those incentives because those purchases have value above and beyond other things that they're incentivizing. Hmm. So for instance, if we'll just use uh, Rudy as an example, if Flesh and Blood is providing Rudy with something special to incentivize people to buy from Rudy, then the assumption is that flesh and blood is getting something from Rudy that they find to be valuable, right? So that's generally how that system is gonna work. Similarly, if a publisher is incentivizing a local retail transaction, it's because they have a reason to value the local retail transaction. Now, what gets really interesting to me, and this is where I wanna start, is the question of what incentive does a player have to buy from a local retail store? Let's start there. Let's start at the base unit. Sure. I think um, that's it. And we can kind of trace it up. And, and in the beginning, of course, we all know the the kind of history of sales. Well, some might say retail. Or maybe, maybe we don't. Well, quite simply, uh, retail brick and mortar stores used to be the only place to buy physical products. And so you would go into, and th this, this changed a ton of landscapes. Walmart destroyed local towns when you used to mm -hmm. only be able to get meat from the butcher and grain from the granary, you know, and, and on and on it goes. And instead, you now had one place that was replacing all of those um, people at lower prices. And so you had a shift to new incentives were there. There was no longer an incentive to buy from the local butcher because the meat was maybe better, cheaper, more available somewhere else. Not to say there wasn't incentives there, which we can unpack. But we saw that industry ever. So it used to be the only place to get it. Then it became not the only place to get it then it became not the only place to get it and you don't even have to go anywhere physically. That was the online revolution that happened. And that all has spun out to lead us to where we are now, that you no longer have exclusivity of the product in terms of ease of access. Mm -hmm. um, anybody worldwide can access the product through the click of a button. And it's the same product you're selling. So in, in a world like that, Assuming all prices are static, mm -hmm. what is the incentive that a player has to buy locally rather than online? I think it's the first thought experiment to do. Again, price is equal. Uh, assuming price is assuming equal. Assuming price is equal. Yeah. Assuming it's all the same. Uh, well, assu assuming price is equal, even just from a local retail uh, reality, 
but before we even get to extras, yeah. Uh, one is you can go buy it right now. Right. And, and by buy it, I don't just mean exchange money for the good. You can physically go get the thing. It's the same reason that sometimes our stream would have some component that broke. It's like, well, if we want to stream today in an hour, Steven's going, and he did this a couple times throughout the pandemic. He mm -hmm. drove to Best Buy, mm -hmm. bought the cord, bought the device, bought the whatever the thing was uh, that you needed to buy. Um, so there's a real uh, upside to be able to buy it, go buy it right now. Um, you also have the upside when you're physically already there, there's a convenience to buying it on the spot, right? Uh, so when you think about a game like Fab, for example, uh, if you can show up on the Friday that a set comes out and hang out and play the game, which is another thing that they potentially offer as a benefit of their existence is a space for you to play this this game and a, a community uh, around it, but we won't go there yet. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Um, and then you decide, you know what? This House Hider set is really cool. And I like this hero and I want more of these cards. Right then and there, you can decide, you know what? I want another box for mm -hmm. six. Mm -hmm. You can also decide, I want a pack, right? I just want to buy one pack, which a lot of times is harder to do online. Uh, it depends on the store, right? But there's other things they can do. A lot of stores sell singles for games. Uh, so if you want to buy a specific card, you can look at it right here. You can see it and you can get it. That's the card, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're buying a card online, I know tons of people that bought from uh, TCG Player, as an example, as a marketplace or eBay, and they get sent a fake card. Or they get sent a card that's not in the condition that they want it to be in. Uh, so you can actually see it. Oh, you want a sealed case? You can buy a sealed case potentially right here from the retail. You can see the sealed case before yeah, you buy you it. See it right? You can inspect it. Yeah. Um, you have an issue with your purchase. Well, what do you do? Uh, if you locally bought it and you opened it right there on the spot or even you took it home and there's an issue with this thing, uh, you might have greater service uh, from the retailer or recourse in terms of what's going on. You know, you open up a case of sealed uh, outsiders and you open it and the boxes in there aren't outsiders. Interesting, right? Yeah. If, if, <laughs> well, what happened, first off? <laughs> I like your reaction there. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. I was literally picturing if that happened in front of me, like someone at our store was buying it, right? But, you know, if, if one of the, a lot of times... <laughs> I always think about the downsides we go through selling online. Uh, and if, if it can be very easy as a business, I think, just zooming out a little bit, to just examine the disadvantages you have or the advantages that you have. So like they're selling it online, they're offering free shipping, they've got a promo, they've got cheaper prices than me. How in the world, right, do I possibly compete with that? Mm -hmm. uh, but once kind you of start, the point of business at the end yeah, of but the game. But if you actually, you can look at that same thing and be like, well, what? What can't they do? Right. And that's why you do good duck building too. Uh, yeah. That's what, is it? Well, <laughs> come in. <laughs> I'll just pause for a second. All right. Or so I've heard, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> um, Not that so, I would know about it. So a lot of times, it, when at least the decks that we have historically found that have been very good, you find some interaction. And usually interactions have a downside, some card or some cost or some ability. And then you start asking, like, how? Do I make the cost actually a benefit to me? And if you can turn your downsides or your weaknesses or your cost into the advantage, yeah, things go crazy. Yeah, and and to pick you up on that line, if you are doing that equation and you can't find that advantage, then you have to stop. Like you you have to go do something else because any any business that is perpetuating into a system that it truly believes it does not have any way to compete. You're, you're just wasting your time and, or extending heartbreak or you're just going to go out of business in a, in a worse way. So like, I think there's a lot of people, even like going back to the bookstore example, there are a lot of bookstores that close in the face of Amazon because they could not pull out mm -hmm. what is my advantage here. Whereas the local place here, like Magic City Books, I know they pivoted really hard into hosting book clubs, making it more about being in an environment where books are like readily available mm -hmm. and uh, hosting people who enjoy the act of reading sure. rather than just selling books like uh, The Borders and Barnes and Nobles. Well, and amazingly, even at scale with something like Amazon, and it's easy to think they're just dominating, but it's still like 10 to 15% of all transactions in the United States are online. Yeah. 10 to 15 so yeah. there's still 85 to 90% of transactions happening 
physically for a reason. Yeah. Um, and part of that might be the act of shopping in person and seeing what you're buying and looking at it and holding it is different. Uh, it's an experience that, you, you know, going down to the store, talking to the shop owner, talking to whoever's working, getting what, you know, there's service things you can do when you have that physical in-person connection with someone, right? In terms of how many boxes do I need? Mm -hmm. The number of times we get asked by people online, how many boxes of fab should I buy is much lower. Although the Discord channel is pretty awesome. People will come yeah. in and ask, but yeah. it's not the same as if you just walk in and you have this thing. Same with like from a new player perspective, uh, the ability to walk in and just potentially educate, like that's another potential benefit. Now you have companies like Best Buy who really struggle with this because they would educate the customer so the customer could pull their phone out and order it on Amazon. Correct. Um, so, and that's why it's in a different category for me. So I, th I think if, if we focus on the original things that you mentioned, which you named all the things and actually a couple extras that I didn't have on my list, but if you look at just strictly at the, as the transaction point, what, what advantage do you have locally? The, f the first one is it's on demand and there is not currently, there's not a phasing technology, right? Where you can immediately get products to somebody. So the biggest advantage kind of on the face of it is that you can immediately have whatever it is that you're desiring in that moment. So on-demand retail is a big deal. That's why convenience stores work like they do. That's why a great many retail models work like they do because somebody needs something right now. Mm -hmm. And usually in those positions, uh, they're going to charge more for it because, hey, yeah, you, we know you need it now and you can't get right. it anywhere but right Like here. if you're buying a birthday candle at a convenience store. Right. Right, that's a ten dollar birthday candle, right? <laughs> you could buy it on Amazon for fifty cents. Yeah, but <laughs> you walk up to the store and you're like, "Why is this ten dollars?" And you're like, "What are you gonna do? Yeah, like, well, go get it somewhere else then." Good, good luck. <laughs> go buddy. order it online. <laughs> uh, the second one is uh, convenience retail, which is kind of baked into on demand, um, but it just, as you said, it can be easier to get something uh, whenever you're already getting something else. So that's why the you know the candy bars exist in the supermarket aisles mm, as you're checking mm -hmm. out, right? It's something that you can offer. There's a value there. And it's like, well, I could technically wait and go order this candy bar for $2 less or for the pack of eight or whatever. And I don't technically need it right now, but I want to have it around in the next couple of weeks. But it's right here and it's easy for me to do. So I'm just going to do it. So I don't have another thing on my list to do later. Mm -hmm. I'm a big convenience guy. So that appeals to me very much. Um, another thing you mentioned is smaller unit sales. So that's singles, that's uh, booster packs. These are things that, you know, a lot of times bigger retailers do not have the staff or the return or doesn't work into their volume-based models to sell in smaller units of uh, purchases. So singular booster packs, uh, those kinds of things, really important. Then uh, the vetting of products slash verification. So I can see what this is. I can hold it in my hands. I can look at it. I can Even make sure Amazon it's sealed, that, et cetera. By the yeah. way, like yeah. fake products all the time. Oh, tons. Mm -hmm. Still, I think in it's board games, big, especially is a thing, big yeah. problem. Uh, and then lastly, as you said, immediate support. I can, I can get help with something immediately. So there's a benefit, a security to knowing that I can go down to the store immediately and get my problem fixed or solved I think a lot of us have like, uh, you know, horror stories of online support where a lot of times it's even great, but I've got to get to a UPS store. I've got to get my label printed. Yeah. I've got to get the thing boxed up. And it's a lot of time that you're investing in recovery after something fails. So that is a benefit. If you could just walk in and say like to uh, you go to a shopping mall and you say, I didn't like this shirt. I want a refund. They do it immediately. And there's a big benefit to that. But then if you take all of those factors and you have to say right now, all of these factors are not outweighing in the minds of some retailers, lower prices or promotional items. And I think that's a, some people do feel that way, some people don't feel that way. So if you're a retailer that it does feel that it doesn't balance out the equation. So then that's, first of all, that's like, well, then there's two options for you at that point, right? Either you're admitting that the thing that brick and mortar does is not enough to outcompete the way that the rest of the world works, online retail, warehouse retail, basement retail, as you said, with even without incentives, just thinking of those lower prices, if we bring those in, because obviously online retailers are going to get more volume, they're bigger. So their advantage is not smaller unit sales and convenience, their advantage is bigger unit sales and cheaper prices, right? So if your set of advantages doesn't compete with them, I think what we find happens is you generate a series of what I would consider misaligned incentives that we've 
come in, uh, we've all come up in an industry that is full of them. And examples, like you mentioned, is uh, expert advice, help, opinions. Somebody comes in, I teach them flesh and blood, I give them a demo, I give them two free welcome decks, I send them on their way and say like, you guys are welcome to come back anytime and learn about the game and buy a booster box from me at MSRP or 20% off even. And then they say, okay, yeah, cool, cool, cool. It's been awesome. This game's been great. They go home, they get on YouTube, they watch a few of our videos, they watch a few of professors' videos. You're like, okay, what's the best way to start playing Flesh and Blood? They do the little Google, Google search is what I do every time. And then uh, they type it in the search bar online, like buy, okay, well, I need Welcome Wraith box. I'll buy Welcome Wraith History Pack 1. They make the transaction online. The retailer never sees them again. Yeah. Right? Or maybe they do see them, but they come back with a full deck. Right. And everything they need to play. Right. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay. Yeah, so like advice and help and these kinds of things don't actually incentivize a retail transaction. Mm -hmm. They might help in the emotional human space of this guy really helped me or this uh, woman really helped me and I, I want to support them because I want to give back. But there is nothing binding, like there's no contractual piece yeah. of that that you're, makes you're it work. You're not paying for that service. Right, right. It, it's a, a soft benefit, as they would call it. That's the it. Business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like I've, I've had these situations myself. Like I've gone into uh, like Fleet Feet here in Tulsa and I've done the, what kind of insoles do I need? And I'll record I'm, you running. I'm going to look at the, my run. Yeah. And then, you know, their shoes are $150 in store and I can get them for 90 on online. Yeah. And so like there is a guilt that you carry with you whenever you, you know, take advantage of things they're offering for free with no obligation to you. And then being the smartest, if you will, consumer that you can be, maybe not the best human in the ethics morality space, but you're being the smartest consumer. The guilt incentive is the only one that exists there. Similarly, the this is where I go to play events is a guilt-based incentive. So like there's nothing about the participation in the event and the buying of the booster boxes that is intrinsically linked between right. customer and store. There's the classic like support your FLDS. Yes thing and and that is based on the belief that uh the local retailer existing stocking a product hosting events being a place for these things to happen has intrinsic value but just like the service at the counter talking about a box um it is disconnected it's a soft benefit and yeah this is we wrestled with this very exact problem for a long time when we were having to the x-wing example keeps coming to mind of compete with you know, a $15 X-Wing ship MSRP was selling online for $8. Yeah. And so for us to compete on price, we'd have to make 50 cents to a dollar per ship, which is not <laughs> sustainable. Yeah, um, and we were doing a lot of stuff for X-Wing in our local X-Wing community at the time. Um, and interestingly, kind of going down that pipeline a little bit to me, another thread I've seen more recently happening in the fab community is uh, essentially... Uh, lobbying uh, criticism at retailers who are running events profitably. Because mm. the natural, like for the advice or for the education, like Best Buy, you see them moving into this service element where they'll offer you extended service and warranties and also offer you training on how to use the stuff and all the stuff, but they're charging for it directly. So a pretty common counterpoint, at least from on my side, is why don't you start charging for the things that are soft benefits that actually are, are your unique value proposition, which is hosting events, offering service, all that stuff. Right? Yeah. Um, but on the other side of that, you have players saying, hey, like you should be, if I'm paying $40 for an event, you should be offering all these incentives to like and all these prizes and all these things. Um, I, I think we're ready to go there uh, because the what we've seen here on, on the, the original retail incentives, why a player would buy from a local store instead of an online store, regardless of kind of the competing uh, incentives, is very specific, on-demand, convenient, smaller unit sales, verifying and vetting the product before you buy, and immediate support are the main ones. But I think most of us would agree that that actually is not enough for tabletop gaming. Like if that were enough, then most retail stores would be just fine. Well, and I think it's important to say that uh, everyone's got a price. As, as altruistic as I think 
I want to be. I think that's the right word for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, that checks out. <laughs> yeah, as, uh, thank you for the. They got the Stephen check mark. It's like a the blue check mark on Twitter, but from be Stephen to Elon. Um, as much as I would like to think this is how humans would behave, if if we you know we say like this this is what I meant earlier the belief that the local retailer offers such important value to the community that you know this the whole support your FLGS vibe which I I admire people in that space um, but everyone's got a price because like my friend who was supporting us back in the 1.0 days and buying the X-wing wave from us. Um, I'm pretty sure the only reason that that price gap was worth it to him is because he personally was a friend and knew what we were trying to do intimately and how much we were struggling. Mm -hmm. Like where we actually, like, really, I need to buy this so that they will genuinely keep, you know. It's charity. Yeah, Yeah. it is totally charity. And we weren't calling it that. But the reason I say that is there's a break point, right? We see this with, we can't, from a history with LCGs with the packs are 15 bucks. And I think you can get away with charging 15 bucks for most LCG packs locally, yeah. if that's what they are. Um, Cause yeah, you can buy them for like 11, 12 online, but you have to pay shipping unless you want to buy $90 with other stuff. And like, you have to wait for it. And so where it really gets uh, more tantalizing is with collectible games and booster boxes. As and prices bigger go up. Yeah. yeah. Because when you're buying a case of, let's say sorcery, there's six boxes in a case price we're charging right now is $150. That's a $900 purchase. So if you can buy that for 20% less online somewhere, you're saving $200. Mm-hmm. And there's, an, for some people, yeah, I'll, I'll spend the 900 buy it from my local store. Glad you're here. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, it's a $200 tip, basically. Yeah. yeah. But for other people, it's like, whoa, wait a second. Like, I'm going to save $200 and then I'm just going to, I'll buy some sodas and some sleeves and (laughs) whatever it is. But the interesting thing to me is if people actually, you know, the market speaks, right? Invisible hand, capitalism, et cetera. But like (laughs) if people actually, the community at large fundamentally believe that the amount of value being provided from local retail was so significant, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. Right. We're having the conversation because there is a valid concern that if local retail went away, where's the community now? Like, Mm -hmm. is it worse or better? And if it, given you're looking at the current paradigms and, you know, or if my game went away or whatever it is, uh, everyone's got this number. And once that number gets crossed, it's like the soft benefits don't make up the gap anymore. But If you were charging the same price and you have all the soft benefits, I think you it's a different story. Right. Right? But or close to the same price. Like the, it's worth some amount, but it's mm-hmm. I don't know that it's worth two hundred dollars on a case of sorcery yeah. amount. And I think that's where it gets really tricky though. It gets really tricky for local retailers because they, you know, a local retailer can't offer the same promo we have. Yeah. So there's an exclusivity there. And most can't offer the same price as a volume warehouse can offer. So how far do you go down the line to try to make it not egregious, but still reasonable to pay for the soft benefits in the price of the retail item? And this is the thing that the entire chain dances around 24 seven that just needs to stop. Yeah, That guilt-based incentives for tabletop gaming products is not a sufficient uh, pretext for a sale. It should not exist. Like that is not the way any successful industry functions if the value is there people should pay for the value and so you're talking about soft benefits right like we we find that local retail and we've we've been doing this dance for so long that we can't compete on just the transaction so what does retail do it spins out correctly into what are the things we can do that online warehouses can't do and that exclusive promos can't do yeah and what are the things that players want and where those lines cross is where there's a wide open field of opportunity. And so we see it kind of in that like there's some events and people are hosting some some stuff and you can come in and play the game and that kind of thing. But to your point, it's A, not being charged in a way that is keeping the store afloat. And B, there's a culture in a, a decent enough group of players that would not pay $30 to play in an event unless they're getting... $30 in kickbacks. And as long as those two things exist together, it's going to be problematic. Yeah. And 
I, I do think it's important, no matter what your if you if you're a retailer, whatever your strategy is, to understand who it is you are trying to offer value to and serve, because you the internet's a big enough place that you're going to hear a complaint from someone. So we uh, host events that I think so, some people would definitely complain about. Oh yeah, in, in that vein, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are events for those people, and if that's if you're just here for the the shiny stuff, um, there are people offering that experience. Let's move on. Let's move from there to the second tier of the equation. So uh, they kind of leave that where it is. The second tier of the equation is what incentive does a retailer have to sell to a player? And that one to me is pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, I think it's to make profit. That's a pretty good incentive. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I, don't mean, I don't think there's anything past that. If you can buy a box of something and sell it to someone else and make money doing it, that stands to reason. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite simple. And and this is this is kind of the beauty of like a marketplace like this, right? <clears throat> the retailer is, is incentivized to sell to players because they're going to exchange money for that good. Yeah. But the player is incentivized to buy from retailers in a million different ways. And that's where the battleground is in retail is how, who can incentivize the most players the most amount of time to be the most successful retailer of these identical products. And that's the game that everybody's in. And I think there's a an under value of doing that on the local level, even in the face of this kind of online revolution, that it's more relevant than ever for you not to expect for people to just come into your store or for you to be the only game in town or for you to get the products that you want. Like that is becoming less and less common on all of those planks. Mm -hmm. And I think there's obviously going to be a tension there of like, this is different than the way that it was. And it really is a bummer because it's way harder. <laughs> but at the end of the day, reality is shifting and the landscape of retail has shifted uh, to force people to be more competitive to get the same amount of return than they have in the past. Yeah, which, you know, when you're coming out of a, I think 2021 to 2022 is kind of a, especially for TCGs, a boom cycle. Yeah. And now people, it's getting tighter and it's more competitive and now you're doing more for less. Um, yeah. You know, for there's a while where any Pokemon box you can get, you just definitely sell. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a different environment these so days. If if we connect these two things, the incentive that a that a retailer has to sell to a player is to make profit on the product, and the incentive for the player to buy from the retailer is locally different than online and different than promotional materials, those kinds of things. Then we have to say in context where stores are not carrying flesh and blood or stores are saying, I'm not going to support Sorcerer anymore because of this beta pre-order. They're making the mental calculus that says, I can't make profit on this product. Whether or not they're right about that is kind of beside sure. the point. But there are some stores that then make the assessment, this product will not make me money, therefore I will not stock it. That's appropriate. That's how it should work. Yeah, I, I think a, a dynamic in the, the industry that has been going on for a long time, I mean, we, we've seen it over and over with games that we tend to love, is if you're not the big three, uh, as a publisher, like, and we haven't even gotten to the, what's the incentive for the publisher to sell through these Yeah, that's channels. the final plank here. But it's very difficult to get retailers to care about your game if you're not the big three. Uh, Fab ran this early, and it wasn't until the end of 2020 when they had their ex explosion moment, uh, which was not brought on by local retail. Right. Specifically. like It was widely available that. at yeah. distribution, yeah. Um, so the uh, when you're not the big three, uh, if you look at part of that, that's where the underpinning of this uh, Reddit thread that you started with, and there's elements in there, you know, talking about, you know, they... And again, not to like dive into this one post and and pick it off, but it uh, saying you know there's only a third of the stores uh, support. It's like Ellis is giving more support than Wizards is the bare minimum, given the 30 year head start by Watsi. But it's like Wizards of the Coast is a giant company owned by a public entity called Hasbro with a 30 year head start. Yeah. So to assume that they even have three times the like they like don't the have capital or the resources or the ability. To even do that, they're they're acting like it's like why aren't they doing this? It's right in front of them. Yeah, it's I mean, easy. hypothetically, if you had endless resources, sure. Like, yeah, but they don't. That's that. That needs to be factored in. But the point of it is, it's the underlying reality that's existed for a long time in tabletop, which is, if you're not Magic, you or Pokemon, and you're a new game, you have to actually ask, what is the incentive? Why why would the retailer sell this thing? Mm -hmm. 
And the reality is a retailer that is just selling all the thousands of products of magic that come out every year. <laughs> um, you don't like, want your jumpstart well, draft there's, there's sealed I, booster I was asking questions collector? on Discord this morning about the Lord of the Rings <laughs> set that's coming out because I'm excited. The art looks good. One of my favorite yeah. artists. Magali Which of the seven versions are you going to get? And, and then they start talking about collector <laughs> boosters and draft boosters and core boosters. And I was just like, what? <laughs> And this is one random weird off, like it's not even like a mainline. Anyways, yeah, it's crazy. the reason I say that is the re reality is it's so much easier for a retailer mm -hmm. just to keep selling the games that are already successful, that have uh, a cadence of product releases that are happening that function in a certain way that they already have a community for. So why would they care about Fab ever is a good question. And this yes. question publishers have to ask, right? Because the recognition is most won't. Yes, it's way harder to launch Fab in your store when you already have healthy communities. So the re like, I think the idea that the objective for Legend Story with Fab as an example, or even Sorcery, Sorcery is even worse. This is a game <laughs> that is high end art, one set a year, no big plans for organized play or tournaments or events that could actually like again, events <laughs> to me are a unique value proposition local retail has to really compete. And, and offer unique value to players. Um, and so Sorcery coming out the gate saying, I mean, you can host tournaments, I guess. We're yeah. not really going to focus on that, though. That and was then, the first 20 years the industry was basically like that, yeah. though. Let's be real. For sure. <laughs> uh, but that was also back when the industry, you couldn't just buy the stuff online. That's right. Yeah, that's true. So it's a, a different dynamic. But the uh, other major pieces, they're gonna they're aiming to put one set out a year. <laughs> yeah. So from a retailer perspective, it's like if you're out there and you're a retailer and you're excited about sorcery, um, because it's also assuming that you know all retailers are like what I'm describing, which is a big three retailer. But I know, like us, there are retailers out there who have like preference in terms of the communities they're building and the mm -hmm. games they're building. They're not just happy with what it is, right? With the, the, the way it's currently functioning, the games. And even with Magic, right? We act like Magic is some... Or not we act... the conversation around all this is acting like magic has cracked the code but i i hear complaints about the way wizards is handling everything like i found out the other day i, I didn't know this that most retailers are paying 95 to 100 dollars a box for magic there is no msrp and you can buy these boxes for 118 to 120 dollars online mm -hmm. so on a box of magic a retailer if they're charging you know what air quotes reasonable prices compared to online is looking at twenty dollars a box mm -hmm. that they off of Magic? I I would always see the box prices like with Pokemon and stuff. Yeah, like, totally. oh, it's got you know okay. <laughs> um, so the reason I say all that though is like there's tons of complaints from retailers who are somewhat successful off of Magic about the way Magic is currently being handled. And you see Wizards more and more asking the question, "What is my incentive?" And that this gets to the last piece of the conversation. What is my incentive to sell to a retailer when they're doing Secret Layer Direct and they're doing more direct sales through Amazon. They're doing more- Magic Gathering Online. Ma for sure. <laughs> and so you just see that pivot happening. And, you know, unfortunately, retail is kind of getting pincered on both sides. <laughs> like yeah, it's awful. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, yeah. we recognize that fairly early that it's like a, it's a bit of a Gordian knot that's happening. You got to find a way through it. But yeah, to your point, so what what is the incentive that a, a retailer has to buy from a publisher and then a publisher has to buy from a retailer or send to a retailer? And one of the key pieces of this that's missing is that publishers aren't actually selling to retailers, right? They're selling to distributors. And the customers of distributors are retailers. Mm -hmm. And so there's a middleman right in between a publisher's desires and a retailer's desires. And that middleman is taking a cut and they have their own incentives. They have their own objectives, right? Because they're ultimately kind of a, a large scale retail incentive. They want to buy product that they can sell for a profit. Yeah. So they have to think that they can buy enough product at enough volume to make their numbers work because they have a smaller margin. So they need to sell more product to make it worth the time to move those boxes around and run it in the warehouse and store it. They've got to make sure that they have enough retailers on board that they think will buy the product that they're gonna take a risk on to stock. So a retailer might want a certain kind of product, but if their distributor or distributors don't wanna take the risk stocking that product, they can't get it. 
So that's another really important relationship that's happening when you think how why does it why does it, why do things function like this right mm -hmm. again to your example the big three it's a no brainer situation for everybody involved the distributors know that all these retailers want the product so they're going to sell it and they're going to make money they're going to get as much as they can retailers know they can make money so they're going to ask the, the distributor for as much as they can get and that's because the players want the product and there's enough people that want to buy it from local retail usually because it's just wherever I can get it I'll get it. Uh, that they're going to have no problem moving that product until you have one line yep. that just doesn't hit and then all the retailers get taken for a ride on a match of the gathering set that nobody wants. Yeah. And then all the, the distributors have 20 pallets sitting in their warehouse and then it starts moving at $20 a box. And we could do an entire podcast on that phenomenon. But with that stuff in mind, what incentive does a publisher have to sell to that distribution retail chain because they're not selling individual stores as much as they might want it as much as they might want to send promos to the stores that are crushing it and they might want to incentivize with certain uh you know uh, programs or pricing schemes yep. they have to go through the distribution network to do that so the incentive again to send to distribution is really to rescale mm -hmm. i mean a publisher is going to send a distribution because they want more people wear their products they want more people buying their products even though they're going to get way less money for those sales. Yeah. So like, what's the, in your mind, what's the fundamental math that a publisher needs to achieve <laughs> yeah. to make distribution make sense? So we've, we've gone over this a few times, but the recognition is if MSRP is $100, a retailer expects to pay around 50, except for, I guess, in Magic, it's now 95. Wild. Which is crazy. Well, there isn't an MSRP, so they can buy it for 95 and sell it for whatever they want. Yeah, distributors can um, sell it, I guess, for whatever they want. Magic sets the price for distribution, which I don't know. Yeah. What that is. So traditionally, it's $100 is a $50 cost for a retailer, is a $40 cost for a uh, distributor, which means the publisher gets 40 bucks, And out of that $40, they have to do everything. Marketing, organized play, printing, design, development, art, all that stuff. Accounting, taxes, everything you got to handle as a business has to, utilities, et cetera, rent, insurance. I can keep, I can go all yeah, the yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can keep finding <laughs> costs, right? Um, and so when you go to uh, retail, right? And by retail, I mean through distribution, uh, you're giving up 60% of your margin to go to distribution. In the 90s, as we've talked about, a lot of it, the reality is that if you want to sell products, uh, you don't have the internet, so you can't sell directly to customers. So you need to get to the people that want to buy it. And so you can either do direct sales to retailers. Sometimes they have catalogs and you can make phone calls and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Uh, or you find a distributor who distributes it to a bunch of retailers to sell whatever it is you're trying to sell. Or you do direct sales to customers. Yeah. yeah. Kickstarter, et cetera. Uh, yeah. um, so, but when you go through distribution as a publisher, uh, if you're only getting 40%, um, then to end up in the spot you would have been if you just sold it directly to a customer for a hundred, uh, you, you have to sell two and a half times mm -hmm. uh, as much product, right? Um, so the recognition on scale and important to know too, uh, let's say out of the $40, you, your cost structure costs you $20 a you know, box of a hundred dollar yeah. box. Yeah. You're making a $20 profit. Well, if you sold that directly to a player for a hundred, um, you now go from making $20 to making $80. So that's four times. Yeah four times the, the profit per transaction. Um, so going through distribution means you need to, to make as much profit as you otherwise would have. You actually need to sell four times as, as much product as going on here. And so you would primarily be incentivized uh, to go this direction because you believe it will achieve scale either in the short term or the long term. So short term meaning the sales are created immediately. Long term means look at a game like Fab. And I think there's an argument to be made with flesh and blood that local communities regularly playing a game that is designed from the ground up to be a game you compete at and you play you know expandable games you play against uh, other opponents who bring customized things to the table there's value in a central gathering place for these people right and these events and these things going on so if you think that in the long run that's going to keep players around longer and they're going to buy more product and all that kind of stuff or you just think that by selling to retailers you will move a higher volume of product um, but it has to be a significant. I mean, we're talking three, yeah. four, five times the scale, if not more. Uh, otherwise, that's that's part of why you see the Kickstarters that you see and the direct sales from publishers, like even Wizards doing direct sales. Uh, because on Kickstarter, you can charge 80 for that $100 product. It go from a $20 cost structure to a $40 cost structure. Plus some Kickstarter fees. 
Yeah. You're going to take 10% or and, something. And still double or triple your profit. Mm-hmm. So you can offer twice the game. And again, a publisher isn't, you have to think about who they're competing with. And a publisher is competing with other games. Yeah. So all of the other games. All the other games. And video games. And, and, well, you know, yeah. Let's not even go there. All the other, all the other and, board and games. And coffee shops games, and food and movies and all, <laughs> right. any entertainment, right? <laughs> so when you're competing there too, it's like, well, do you want to spend $100 on the 300-pound Kickstarter box of board game content? Or do you want to buy a box of Flesh and Blood? Right? Like that's... There's a, I mean, it mm-hmm. really happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Like a hundred dollars, and it's literally a forty pound box board game, or a box of fab. Yeah, like you, price equivalency, right? You have to you have to factor that in. So, in, incentive though for a publisher would be that you believe in the value by going down the chain. Yeah, and you believe that the distributor will get your product to retailers, which doesn't always yeah. happen. And also, saw. another assumption here. <laughs> Yeah, bring it on. Is that distributor, like when we say choosing to go to distribution, you're assuming you're going to, it's going to happen. Yeah, by choosing to, you're basically offering it to distributors. Yeah, you're pitching it to them and hoping they'll yeah. buy it. And you mentioned earlier, like distributors taking risk on products and that they think they can sell, right? Um, which is not always true anymore. Like you've talked to enough small and medium sized publishers and like distributors don't want to pay for things until they sell it. Like right. I'll warehouse it for you, but I'm not buying your crazy you yeah. know once a year sorcery game i don't even know because remember it all comes down to contracts yeah. and every distributor might be different a, a contract between us and sorcery us and flesh and blood uh, alliance and flesh and blood alliance and sorcery those are all structure can be structured very differently yep. so it, one distributor might get a product for a reason that nobody ever knows yeah right they paid more for the product or they offered better terms or those sure. so all the distributors could, are also competing with each other yeah could be how soon you com- commit to orders right right could be um uh, there's all sorts of factors that, that can yeah. happen there and who knows what how, how all that functions mm-hmm. um there was another point there that i thought go ahead it's just an onion there's yeah, so it's, many it's layers all, it's all connected um and what's weird about it is like when you oh, when you start, thought. you don't think it matters. But if you take an individual problem that you notice as a player and you start running it all the way up through all of these layers, there's an answer. It's always connected. There's always an answer to yeah. why it's being done a certain way. So another issue that happens here and an assumption that's baked in, and one of the problems that actually that happens, right? So let's say you assume you're a publisher and you're like, I'm going to go to retail. And you pitch to distributors and you actually convince them to go ahead and buy the product, right? Yeah. And they're going to do everything they do. They're going to email all their stores. They're going to include you if they have a trade magazine. Put it on the weekly newsletter. There. Yeah. Uh, maybe Which everybody reads. <laughs> maybe their reps will call all the local retailers. Who knows what's going to happen next? But, do they still do that? I think so. Yeah. But the other issue, let's go back to Jimmy's basement, right? Mm-hmm. Which is when you go to distribution, it's kind of like a black box. Yeah, like you're saying, the, the, Depend- you could maybe structure a contract to try to make it not this way, but I don't know that anybody uh, would accept try. it. You can try, yeah. And, yeah. and again, if you're if magic, you can. Yeah. If you're Pokemon, you can. <laughs> you got power, right? It's yeah. like, oh, you don't want to distribute my games under my terms. I guess we'll just sell the stores directly. Yeah. And they actually have the power, right? Yeah. Um, but they also have the power to shape how all this is functioning, because they're they're. So. So it's about influence, <laughs> I guess. What you're saying? Yeah. Well, it's about the, power and influence. What is it, House of um, Cards? But the reality of the black box, and as I said earlier, like Covenant got to start because some there were distributors that gave us accounts. I still don't know why. <laughs> like even like the financial forms you have to fill out. It's like I, yeah. Um, and so when you have this uh, magic black box called distribution, um, I think in an ideal world, what you want as a publisher is your giving this discount to distribution slash retail because the behaviors they're they're doing, whatever it is they're doing, you're wanting to incentivize that activity, right? I'm going to give you a discount on fab boxes, Mr. Retailer, because you're going to sell this product for me. You're going to offer customer service. You're going to teach people how to play the game. You're going to host events. You're going to build a community. You're going to do all this. That's the like ideal version of this. Mm-hmm. The truth is that that same system that you send these boxes down, these products down into, also hooks right into deep discount online retail, Jimmy's basement card shop, mm-hmm. um, and so eBay. eBay. And so if 
I can buy it for 50 bucks. And it's, I'm a random TCG player account number 826. <laughs> um, I can sell, you know, fab boxes, $60. Am I willing to make $10 a box? Yeah. I mean, it's free money to me if people are willing yeah, to buy it, right? Yeah, what's going to do about it, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, publishers have, uh, you've, you've seen like Asthma Day try with the map policy and the MSRP policy. But it's like so hard to police, especially when it gets down to random account name, eBay, TCG player, whatever. Um, and who knows? Like it could just be a person that bought some boxes from a local retailer trying to get rid right. of some extra stock, right? Right. Um, so even if you decide that it's worth it, that that system has a lot of holes in it mm -hmm. that are, even if what you're trying to do as a publisher, you, you talked earlier about, you know, I'd love for the stores to have these like buy a box from us. But fundamentally, basic question for me, how do you get buy a box from us to retailers? And is it through distribution? And are they willing to do it? And are they going to charge you for it? And can you trust them to do it? And can you trust them to do it on time? And can you trust them to do it equitably? It, are they actually going to send the buy a box promos to the right people? Mm -hmm. Or, and and you have to coordinate all this. And there's a lot of, and then it's like, well, do I have to do this for every distributor? And is every distributor that we use willing to do this? And if it's only the US distributors that I can get to agree to do this and the European one doesn't want to touch it, are the European stores, European stores going to be upset that they don't get the buy a box promo? Yes. But the US stores get the buy a box promos? Yes, they are. So it's, all that to say, there's a lot of nuance, uh, and and there's a the just a minefield of issues out there, and so I, I think it's it's good that people are concerned and asking questions, and hopefully this just helps give context and help people ask more questions. And I'm curious, everyone listening out there, for all kinds of takes on this in the podcast channel and the Discord channel. Yeah, and this is the the last thing that I'll say that I think addresses a lot of this directly. Um, talking about promotional cards, talking about uh, lower prices, those kinds of things, is basically you, you have to understand that the people like us who are getting promotional cards or you know extra incentives from publishers beyond what a local retailer might get, there's two things at work there. One of them is the publisher saying, uh, we think what you're doing is valuable enough to incentivize sales for you. So like it's basically a like, thank you for what you were doing, what you've done. Here's a way to reward that behavior. But then secondarily, it's like we're competing constantly with everybody. Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing everything we can to get the most favorable contracts possible, to get every promotional card in the world that we, that we could, to get every, like the lowest price imaginable. I would love to be able to outcompete everybody all the time on every product. <laughs> like if you're not playing that same game, you, you have to understand that's the, that's the battlefield. Like that's what everybody is doing. So like, we're not just gonna take a knee to miniature market so that we're not on the list of people that local retailers don't like, yeah. you know, or like that are cited as like problematic uh, to the chain itself. Like at the end of the day, as a local retailer, you have to use what you have to compete with all of the people out there who are doing the same and they're gonna try to do it the way that they do it. The, the warehouses are gonna try to get ever lower prices uh, you know, the Rudeers are going to get ever more favorable kits and you have got to get ever more uh, impressive local store competitive differentiators. And in the face of like not finding those, uh, you've got, you have to adapt or go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, I think it's just like a, a fair, reasonable thing to say. And so coming back to this idea that um, flesh and blood the easiest thing to do for a retailer right now is to drop flesh and blood and not make any any profit. I, I think that's a notable statement. And, and flesh and blood as a publisher should say, if there are not enough players who are incentivized to buy from local retail, and if therefore there's not enough local retailers incentivized to buy my product and sell it, then A, I need to change something so that I incentivize people to buy from local retail better, which is the suggestion. Mm -hmm. Or B, I need to work through the channels that are working and prioritize my efforts there if local retail isn't the channel that's doing it for me. And I don't know what any of these publishers are going to do. I think Sorcerer's faced with the same problem. I think Magic's faced with the same problem. I think everybody is constantly faced with the same problem. And I think the inevitability is like somebody's 
going there the the experiments are going to continue mm-hmm. and we're going to find out what's actually important here in all of this spin uh and that is a fascinating day whenever i mean imagine it imagine the day where magic literally just says like we're not selling to local retail anymore yeah I mean, they could easily do it, right? You do it tomorrow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I will say just for some some more context on the fab front, mm-hmm. basic example, one last thing for me. I still am very confident and I know the vast majority of fab boxes are not moving online. Easily. Like, not even close. I don't think it's even anywhere near yeah. close. I, I yeah. mean, I know early on conversations with Legend Story slash James um, their commitment to the local place to play is very mm-hmm. high. And even in some of these arguments, it's like, well, why are you incentivizing the online ways to get these products? And yeah. there's reasons to do that or not do that, right? But ultimately- well, I will tell you one thing. They weren't the majority of sales in the beginning. Right. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> but that is a big, big part of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um but the, yeah, it's part of why I have this whole conversation now. <laughs> like if, if the sales hadn't happened up front and the players hadn't been created to get to the point where this is even a conversation, uh, yeah. But the there is a commitment um, from the Legend Story side, specifically the FAB, uh, to send the majority of product through local retail, period. And so that they've chosen that this is the place where most of the product is going to end up. And I know a lot of FAB boxes are moving. And if... Lowest price a map is they have a map policy in the United States plus a promo. Um, if that were actually as significant a factor as I think some people make it out to be in this whole equation, our subscriptions would be sold out. Right. We don't have access to infinite supply. We were sold out for a time when Fab was absolutely bonkers. <laughs> when the first edition was Tindy Town, yeah. as they say. Um, yeah, but we're not. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to say Fab is not successful for us because it is. But at the same time, I I I think. And it, it, to go back to something I mentioned earlier, the dynamic of, yeah, it is easier to just keep selling magic for a lot of stores. Uh, I totally get it. Um, but if to think that Legend Story is going to compensate so hard that it now becomes worthwhile to get someone to switch off of that, I don't think there's actually a enough money <laughs> to do it, right? E- even if you could pick one store at a time, it's like the amount you would have to pay to get a store that's currently successful off Magic, to be like, you know what? I think it's worth trying to convert all my Magic community into Fab. Even if the money was the right number, I the, the risk involved in switching into a game that's unknown and a publisher that's smaller and talking about an underdog and all this kind of stuff. So like the fundamentals to me are you have to create a game that is phenomenal, that people want to play. You have to create players and you have to continue growing that player base to a point where retailers can like the incentive for them is that they can sell the product. Yeah. And so it's undeniable. And I know there are a lot of retailers out there selling fab very successfully. And to it, it's not going to universally be successful for every retailer who just wants to flip a switch and sell as many boxes of fab as they're selling as magic. If that if that's the primary like piece of it, it it's very hard to make that happen, mm-hmm. especially overnight. And like this is a game that currently is about four three and a half years old. Uh, and seemingly doing very well, but is not magic yeah. or wizards. But there's also, for those reasons almost entirely, That's a lot. there's a lot of good reasons to be diversifying into a game like Flesh and Blood. Mm-hmm. And if it were an easy, no-brainer decision 24-7, uh, then there would be no retail industry. It would just be yeah. unicorns and Well, and if it dreams. were an easy, no-brainer decision every retail in the world would be trying to sell fab. Right. Which we saw for a minute. Mm-hmm. And uh, when it was a no-brainer, right? Yeah, when it when was it literally was, well, a no-brainer. I can sell a first edition box for 300 What did you see? Yeah, 100%. Every Retailers retail weren't talking, talking about dropping it. fab off their shelves at that moment, yeah. were they? Yeah, but the... Yeah, I'm not going to dive in. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can go on for it. We'll, we'll catch you on part two. Yeah, it's, this it's, is it's fascinating stuff. I I, uh, I think I think we're in, the swir- in a very important swirl of this industry. I keep saying that, but I, I just want to maybe I just want to get on the record. I want to mark me moment mark for me. you. Uh, and this is a this is just a, a fascinating time to be here. It's a time of disruption. It's a time of adaptation. Uh, things have changed and are continuing to change. You you can feel something. We got to give, right? Yeah, it uh, will give. There there are things. That, there's just the elements at large that have to give. Even the if all you did was look at the magic environment, and I'm only tangentially aware of that. 
but it feels like something's got to give there. Something's about to give yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So hope you're along for the ride with us. Till next time, keep playing.